Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, Braden Pinga. There's your intro. What's up, man? What's up? <laughs> Do you remember how long ago you came on here? What was oh, it? man. What was that? That had to have been, I don't know, six weeks ago? <laughs> it seems like six weeks ago. Time flies, man. Maybe it was a couple months ago. That was probably a year ago. Over a year ago, I'm guessing. Really? Yeah, you were on here. No. Yes, come on now. That, a that, year ago? That actually segues right into my with something that I always want to ask you about. Is that where are you at with this head trauma situation? What, what do you think? America, oh, so you said I got it. You're saying I got CT. No, I'm saying, I'm saying I can't that remember everything. That would have been the perfect timing to use one of like the the head. Oh, I got knocked in the head. Jokes when you said I was on here six weeks ago. When in reality it was like sixty weeks ago. It, what, was it really over a year? Okay. Well, I'll say this. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the f- football is the culprit. I don't. I don't believe that uh, you could just blame one thing on head trauma. It's a whole, you could say, kind of uh, holistic kind of deal in the sense that everything has uh, life causes head trauma. I mean, if you just look at if you go to a nursing home, I mean, everybody's got. I don't know if everybody there, but there's a lot of people there that had no history of any contact sports or anything like that that have CTE or dementia or anything associated with head trauma. And my wife's grandma had that. She passed away about a month ago. And then, I mean, the other thing too is, is in Australia, cause you know how getting the, uh, you could say diagnosing CTE is only done through people that passed away in Australia. Somebody was about uh, last year it hit the new wire that, uh, Somebody, it was a dude that was 40 years old, never had any history of contact sports, and they found out that he had CTE. So you can't blame the game. And then the study that came out, I'm telling you, man, that study was messed up. 111 or 110, 111 brains had CTE. That means that football is the problem. Well, you know what? I could have taken that same exact sample and said, okay, I'm going to see if there's association with drinking water and CTE. And guess what? I would have found out, H. CTE in water does have an association. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's where I'm at. I mean, obviously, football is going to, you know, it's going to beat you down. It's like when you, you know, have your joints messed up or what have you. But that's not like, to me, that's not what it's about. To me, it's like, can you recover? You can recover. And the same with your head. And so I don't look at it as football is the culprit. And so I'm not a, I'm not one of those that they're going to go out and tell my son not to play football just because I'm afraid he's going to get a concussion or a bunch of concussions and then have, you know, CTE issues the rest of his life. But does it, don't you think it speeds up the process, I guess, of dementia, of brain disease, brain damage? Um, uh, no, I don't believe it does. Because like I said, if it, as long as you handle it in a, an appropriate way, I mean, like a good example would be like, let's say you go pop your ACL, right? And you chip off a little of the uh, cartilage and instead of going and doing the proper rehab and all that kind of stuff you decide to just go out and just continue to rip up that knee to the point to where now it needs to be replaced and you could easily cry and say oh it's the game that did that because the game caused that initial injury right and i look at it the same way as the brain the brain's a little bit harder though to, to gauge because it's not like there's something connected versus disconnected it's just more like oh i got a headache or i just went out and played a football game or whatever i went boxed or uh you know there's a number of other sports i was in soccer and i headed a ball and all of a sudden i started seeing stars whatever it is and uh, the problem i believe in our game though age with football is a lot of these dudes you know you know as much as i do that after a game you go out head trauma so you got trauma there that needs to be addressed it needs to be rehabbed and what do they do they go and they just booze or they take drugs they do other stuff to try to take the edge off that we know i mean if you went to the dare program if you, were you in the dare program in high school or middle school yeah or in elementary i was there yeah what remember those commercials come on they show an egg they're like here's an egg then they crack the egg and put it in the the frying pan and they go this is your or the, the egg is your brain and then they put the egg in the frying pan and they go this is your brain on drugs i mean we all know that that t- too much Alcohol, too much drugs is going to cause brain damage. So if you've already gone out and caused trauma in your brain and then you go and you just douse yourself with a bunch of drugs and alcohol after that and you do that for two, three days and then you go back out to practice again, it, you're never allowing your brain to fully recover. So it comes down to, yeah, you're going to put it through trauma. There's no question that the, the, hitting your head and getting stars and all that kind of causes brain trauma. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's a foregone conclusion. But the, the question is, is, 
can you recover quick enough to get ready for the next game and so on and so forth? I'm saying you can based off of following a, a you can say a prototype or a prototype, a protocol of therapy and of recovery that uh, would basically be the same kind of situation if you had any other kind of injury. Do you have the, like, okay, so how, what's like the magic number then? Obviously there's not one. We're all different. Everyone's built different. Is there a time when you, it becomes too many time, You've seen stars too many times to where you cannot recover and you should shut it down? Uh, well, it depends. Each situation is different. And so, I, yeah, I mean, there's guys that have done that, that have shut it down because they felt like they're more susceptible to concussions what about you? after like, having a number. How many, do you ha- how many have you had uh, officially? Uh, oh, where they diagnosed it and yeah, it was like, oh, you got a concussion? Well, I had one in 1996, which I think what, you were like five years old Wait, at that were time. were you 29 years old then? <laughs> were, you in Uruguay, were, you in, were you in Uruguay? Oh, no, no. This was when I was in a sophomore year in high school. Okay. That was the most severe. Then I had, uh, I, in college, I never was diagnosed with a concussion, although I had concussions and then um uh, what else in the nfl i had two so i'd my rookie year and then i had one in training camp in 2009 i remember that you got dinged in camp and you or 2010 you took some yeah. time you, you actually took the time you were smart to try to recover yeah well that was when they started making the emphasis so and i yeah it was a stupid drill anyway but it was like a like the power drill you hit the pulling guard six times in a row which if you really want to like avoid head trauma, like don't run that drill. Okay? It's gonna make you a man. And what Brady? does that ever happen? Tough. What does that honestly ever happen in a game? It never does. Very rare. But uh, but anyway, those were the times. But I mean, I've been deemed, I don't know how many times. Like when I, oh yeah, I mean in that like there was a Chicago game we had. I think it was two thousand nine. I got dinged big time, and I just fought through it. And I, mean, I could have easily gone and said, hey, I got a concussion, but I don't think I had any out, outward symptoms that would have even like even today's game where they got like spotters you know, up in the box and everything, they wouldn't even have noticed. So, I mean, there, and I, I can't even count how many times I've had those to where I just fight through it and you just play and you go with it and, and so on and so forth. But then afterwards, I would say like, if, like, let's say I had a concussion, it would take a couple of days, like just, you just resting and doing the proper kind of treatment and you'd feel good again. So, yeah, who knows? But I mean, I guess like you're right. Everybody's different. I don't know. There's not enough information about it, but I can't for us to sit here and say without, all the information that absolutely the game causes CTE. And, and what that means to me is, is that if you play it, you're destined to have CTE, no matter what. You're going to have CTE, you're going to have symptoms, you're going to have a terrible life, your quality of life is going to be horrendous. And I, I mean, I find that hard to believe when I look, you know, one of my neighbors, Clay Matthews' dad, Clay Matthews Jr., who's played more games than any other linebacker in its history of the NFL. And the guy's, I think, coming up on 60, if he's not there yet already, the guy's great. I mean, he's not, you know, twitching or doing weird stuff. I mean, that's so I was like, explain that one to me, guys. You know, and I'm sure I bet you a million bucks too that if you go and you opened up his brain after he passes on, he'll probably have signs of CTE. He just didn't have the expression of it. And so, and I would say you could probably say that about a lot of people in and out of contact sports. No question. Did you see the Will Smith movie? Heck no. I'm not doing that. Yeah, I didn't I'm not, either. I'm not, yeah, I'm not giving this guy this this credit to tell us that this is what it is. It's like you studied a guy, the Webster guy, right? You know all about him. Yeah, yeah, of course. Better for the Steelers. I mean, that dude was a steroid freak. He was, as all the Steelers were in the in is the he? 70s and 80s. Allegedly, which yeah. Which everybody was. Allegedly. Well, no, I mean, they admit it. I mean, Do they? I mean, at that time, it was sort of, I guess it was legal, and people just did it. It was cultural. They didn't test then, at the, uh, in the 70s. They didn't test. No, man, it was like taking creatine, you know what I mean, or protein. I mean, they just, I mean, it was sort of like, this is what you do if you play. And then, uh, you know, he was also a big boozer. So, I mean, you go study that. I mean, he probably didn't even have to play football. Just based based off of lifestyle, they could have found the same kind of, you know, I would say results. And then it sort of just happened that he played football that, yeah, I mean, if you got all all that stuff added together, lifestyle, the game, you're going to, you're going to put your brain through the ringer versus, you know, somebody that's outside of the game. But still, your brain's going to go through the ringer. I mean, there was a study that was done last year that because we had this huge argument. I was on one of my radio hit segments throughout the week in Miami. This guy's name's Orlando Azuguere. And uh, he, he thinks that pot should be legalized in the NFL and that it should replace the opiates, you know. And mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, that's fine. But it's like you can't sit there then and complain about having concussions. He's like, well, what are you talking about? And I go, because it's been proven, and there's studies that show this, that marijuana smoking or even just injecting it, the drug portion of it, not the part that 
that's the uh, the therapeutic part, but the part that's the drug that gives you the rush, as you know, that can be sort of divided up. It's the a whole THC, topic. THC, you're saying, yeah, THC is what gets you. Yeah, high. yeah, the, the high part it it affects your cognitive thinking, and and they just basically did a study where they took a group that were known to be recreational pot smokers versus those that weren't. And they studied brain retention in terms of like, they'd ask them or they'd have them read certain things and then they'd ask them questions for recall. And over time, the the study group that was marijuana smokers, they slowly were deteriorating in terms of the amount of information they could recall versus the other group stayed pretty steady as to how much information they could recall that shows very clearly that it, it does affect the brain. So point there being is that, uh, I, you just, it's a holistic thing, man. You just can't blame the game. That's where I've come from. You just can't blame the game. It's like anybody that hurts their knee and decides not to rehab. You just can't go back and say, oh, it's football's fault. It's all its fault. No, I mean, you got to take some of your own responsibility, which we do. But then I, at the same time, I'm not absolutely saying that. I'm also saying that there's predispositions, there's genetics, there's a whole other kind of, uh, you know, collection of things that are going to, that have to sort of fall into place too for it to, to happen so i mean it's it's bigger than we all believe and that's why i don't i'm not gonna follow this guy I'm not gonna, i don't care what he says i don't care what that doctor says i don't care half the doctors say okay aaron yeah. Rodgers' bone was it 100 percent healed it doesn't matter if the bone was all that matters is if he can he's going out there you know what i'm saying like that guy's stuff yeah just who gosh. what doctor said that i saw you that's one of my favorite things to do is open my phone up and see who you <laughs> fought with on Twitter the night before because you are on different times. You're you're on the West yeah. Coast, so I can wake up and I can see who you just got done sparring with two hours before. <laughs> I forgot that doctor. He's he Doctor has Chow, a, actually. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah, he has like a Twitter feed. And so, if you have any sports questions, you go and or sports injury questions. He was you the go ask him. Chargers team doctor, I believe. Oh, okay. Back in All the right. day, we had him on as a guest. I think one of the times I was hosting on the NFL channel on Sirius XM. Okay. Okay. I mean, he ha he gives good insight. I'm not saying they don't. So I'm yeah, not saying that was a for, good information. For people that don't know what happened with him, he made a comment about Aaron Rodgers' collarbone, and then you had a response. Well, actually, what happened? He responded to me because yeah. I, they were saying somebody was somebody asked me on Twitter if uh, you know if 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 the Packers are you know kind of taking a risk by putting Aaron out without his you know, being 100% healthy or whatever. And I told him, I go, look, I know Doc McKenzie better than anybody. I've dealt with this guy with two ACL surgeries. And uh, he's he's the kind of guy that when you're 100% healthy, meaning you're ready to play, he's still going to wait like a month for you to play. He's just not going to throw you out there, meaning he's extra conservative, you know. And so I basically said that uh, unless Aaron's 100% ready to go and that bone's 100% ready to heal, He's not playing. And then the doctor piped it. There's no way in six weeks that bone's 100% healed. And that make, in my mind, it, that, just, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that. What it means is, in my mind, in football terms, if you're 100% ready to go, it means that you, when you enter on that field, you're taking on the same amount of risk that day as if you were 100% between quotations healthy without any issues. And, and I mean, and I, and I, and I reference the ACL. I go, you know as good as anybody that when you come back off of an ACL reconstruction – your ACL or that that new ligament they put in there is only 60% healthy. It's only 60% strong as it's going to be. It's still got to strengthen up. But, yet yeah, you'll tell guys and you'll pass guys on physical saying, yep, they're 100%, right? And so that's what I'm saying with Aaron. It's like, yeah, even though the bone literally isn't 100%, whatever that means, now he's got a titanium-like thing around it, uh, he's still 100% ready to go or else he's not going to be going out there. So that's why – you know, getting a little beef with these doctors, they act like they're the end all be all of information, which they're not. They give good information that we can value and you can process, but you also have to think on your own. Well, that's the biggest thing, think on your own. But yeah. Doc McKenzie, you, you talked about, he had the thing going back with Martellus Bennett. And oh, yeah. I know a lot of guys that played in Green Bay stood up for him. And Doc McKenzie is by far the most conservative doctor of all the 32 NFL doctors for each team. Yeah. He is so absurdly conservative that you would have to fight him to try to get back on the field. And yeah. Have great, we have a great relationship with him. He's the absolute man. And once you get away from there, you realize, I think, how, how, like, oh, oh this guy really does care about, like, us, me, my family, everyone else. He doesn't care. He would tell you, like, he would get blunt. Like, I don't, AJ, you're an idiot. I don't care about right now. Like, today doesn't matter. You'll be fine. Exactly. Like, don't exactly. stop being an idiot. And I'd be like, come on. And then he's, so <laughs> I don't know. An idiot. Because he cared about you as a person. He really, and then you realize that I would have to come back and apologize, Doc. You know, I, you know, I just want to, uh, I'll listen to you, whatever you want to do. And he's like, I know, I know how you are. So I, I get it. So when 
the whole Martellus Bennett situation happened, he came out and said something about Doc McKenzie. I don't know. Did you uh, like? What were your thoughts on that? Oh, it's a, it a blatant lie. Because I've had those same conversations with Doc as you have, to where it's like, I mean, and and to me, I mean, I lived it in a in a contrast of what it was like to have Doc McKenzie versus another doctor in a matter of days, when the Packers let me go in 2011. And uh, I was, you know, in Pat's office having a physical. He's like, oh, yeah, you're 100% ready to play. But he's like, you're not going to play in training camp. And I'm like, what? I was like, oh, damn, I've been running around for the last, like, four or five months. I'm fine, man. And he's like, nope, nope, we're going to take it slow and blah, 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 blah. And I do believe that, like, the Packers, that was a big reason why they weren't going to wait around for me. And that was with the new rules, no two days and things like that. And so, sure enough, I get cut. Then I get signed by uh, St. Louis. And I walk into St. Louis, do a workout. And their doctor checks me. He's like, oh, you're ready to practice tomorrow. All right, man. Here we go. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I got Doc McKenzie telling me I got to wait a month versus the St. Louis Rams doctor saying, man, you're ready to go. You know? So, and I mean, I was laughing because I was like, oh, I mean, Doc would have just, I mean, he would have, wouldn't he, he wouldn't have flipped like head over heels, but he would have been laughing to himself like, wow, that's being a little bit more aggressive than I would have been, which like, like you said, like, that's why when Martellus Bennett came out, this like, he was absolutely lying, trying to save face and you know, which uh, reality is, is I, I don't even know what he was thinking because apparently he got, you know, shut down anyway with the, the Patriots. But I, I had to have been at first because I, I do believe he's complex, Martellus, in the sense that at first his reaction was, oh, this sucks. Aaron's out. I'm not going to get the numbers that I usually get. My value is going to decrease. I got to find a way out of here. You know, so let me try to justify my shoulder being the issue. And then Pat's like, no, man, you can play on that shoulder. You've been playing on it blah, 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 blah. And then that's where he explodes because now he's not getting his way. Then he goes to New England, the place where he probably wanted to go anyway after Aaron got hurt to play with Tom. And then he finally comes to find out, shoot, man, this thing just, it, you know, it's probably already so much in his, so, uh, his foreconscious now because he had been making such a big deal about it that he's thinking about it all the time. And, and he finally shut himself down or they shut him down. But uh, I mean, it, it was it was slander, man. He he was literally slandering Doc McKenzie, and that's why I felt you know I was one of those guys to come out and say, like, "Dude, you're you're not telling the truth. This is this is a lie because this this is not Doc McKenzie. This is not how he operates." Yeah, of all the guys that have ever played for Green Bay, I think Martellus is probably the only guy that's ever said that that Doc McKenzie <laughs> yeah. pushed him to play sooner than he wanted. Oh yeah, I was hoping he would tell me that. I mean, I hope he would let me play earlier than I would. Uh, was ready, you could say, between quotations. Come on, man. I mean, you. I remember that. What was that? 2008 when you had your growing. I mean, dude, you were like the bionic man. You had your oh, growing, had your pec muscle, too. My grow <laughs> was it? I haven't heard that in a while. What would you say again? What that, What was it? My growing? <laughs> your growing. My groin. And, <laughs> my groin. What? What? Is that the wrong way I to say I forgot about this. So, I, yeah, obviously, any people. Any, so, the last I'm time you were. dude. Remember, I say the crick. You're up the crick, dude. Up the crick. So, you a big Josh Allen fan, the quarterback? Oh man, no, I'm not. Why? I, I mean, it's, well, I called it the best for him. I, I called his game overall. I called his game against uh, Utah State. No, he's a good player. I mean, he's just he's not he's not a guy that I would invest a first round draft pick on because he's there's too many questions to me. If I'm, ta I'm if I'm drafting a guy in the first round, I need a turnkey guy, man. I don't need a guy that I have a lot of questions. He's a mystery man. You know what I mean? Like you want guys to come into that first round, especially if you don't have a quarterback. I guess if you got a guy that you can help sort of bring him along, like you know Brett did with Aaron, it's a little different story. And you're drafting later in the draft. I'm fine with that. But to say he's like the potential first overall pick, I mean, he doesn't. Even, I mean, uh, theor theoretically, you're supposed to dominate at the college level first, right? Before you're like, you know, number one overall pick or number two, at least a top 10 guy, and uh, he hasn't even done that. I mean, he's had games that have been terrible statistically, but he's got all the physical attributes that a coach, I'm sure, would feel like I can work with and we can develop some of the more you know, detailed nuances of the position. But overall, I don't look at him as a top 10 pick. I mean, I don't, I, Josh Rosen, though, oh, my gosh. Talk about overrated. This guy, age. What happened? Jeez. He's a UCLA quarterback for people that UCLA don't know. UCLA quarterback, but I mean, you you study his film. Yeah, he's got moments to where he looks very polished in the in the pocket. You know, he's got he's smooth, he's relaxed. He just he's fundamentally looks pretty sound. But then there's times, and they're critical times, to where he acts like, oh, I've mastered all the basics. I'm just going to go off on my own. And he disrespects, you could say, the fundamentals. The sound fundamentals of quarterbacking. And I'll get the best example was I was covering his game against Texas AM. It was a crazy game. They had like a 35 point comeback in the second half. UCLA did. 
And one of the big plays of the game was he throws a go route off his back foot. I mean, like a fadeaway go route. I mean, he's trying. So he's trying to try to throw the ball 60 yards while he's fading away. Obviously, he doesn't have the arm strength. Not many guys do. To Aaron's one of them to to complete that pass, and he underthrows the receiver literally by 15 yards. And all the defensive back had to do was jump up and catch the ball. And so he did. He jumped up, and sure enough, it looked like he was going to high point it and catch it and re- you know, start running for an interception. And lo and behold, it slips right through the middle of his hands. And the receiver's like, whoa, he's right behind him, caught it, turned around, and went in for a touchdown. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that right there. And 99.9% of other plays, that would have been the, 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 the play that ended their comeback efforts. You know what I mean? But no, they scored that touchdown, and then he had another play where he's trying to throw the ball out of bounds again. Is falling back, fade away, bad mechanics, throws it up in the air, and lo and behold, it falls into the receiver's hands. Point is, is that it, that was a to, to me a troublesome kind of tendency that he has, and the biggest one was against USC. I don't know if you caught this. So he gets he had two turnovers down in the red zone. One was he goes down there, and so USC started off showing a single high safety. So he's thinking, oh, I got a single high safety here, so I'm going to try to manipulate him away from the middle of the field and then go back to the middle of the field. But what he didn't realize is that at the snap of the ball, they shifted from a single high to a double high look. And so sure enough, here's that that safety who he's trying to move. Oh, he's moving all right. <laughs> so he's like, all right, I got him off the spot. I'm so cool. He didn't even like – Take in any other information because you don't know, cover one. Where are you trying to protect? Think about it. Where are you trying to funnel your guy, age and cover if one? If there's single high safety, yeah, inside, right? Of course. Well, huh? Everybody's got outside leverage here. They're trying to push everybody outside. Is this cover one still? Yeah, I still think it is. Oh, he's moving out, and so he just like no look throws it, and there it is. The other safety's dropping back in the second half. Just is like, are you kidding me? This is gold. Boom, catches it. I'm just like, dude, again. It's that kind of mentality like he just he, – he thinks he knows it all. He thinks he's arrived. He thinks he doesn't have to practice and implement like the basic fundamentals. And if I'm a scout or an executive, that would scare me. And, and where you draft him will be huge for his progression because if you draft him, like I said, like top 10, top 15, basically what you're telling him is, hey, you're a finished product. You're plug and play, man. Whereas if he drops, which I predict, and I could be wrong, obviously, but I predict that he's going to be the guy that's sitting in the green room and everybody's looking at, oh my gosh, your value has dropped. Oh my God. Because right now he is the quintessential smoke screen. I mean, teams would believe it if you're like, oh, we want Josh Rosen. You know what I mean? Trying to get other teams to maybe trade over him or just to distract him for the guys who they really want. And so... There's going to be a perception, I do believe, that he's going to drop when, in fact, I believe teams already look at him as a, like a late first rounder because that same reason I'm saying is that if you draft him too high, you're sending the wrong message. Whereas if you draft him lower in that first round or even in the second, I don't know if he gets to the second, but at least in the later part of the second round, it'll it'll put a chip on his shoulder and he'll be like, okay, I'm going to go prove these guys that, you know what, I'm the real deal that I should have been drafted higher. And then he works harder and uh, – respects so to speak those quarterback fundamentals just a little bit more and if he does that he's got the physical tools he just got to be teachable this is his only uh weakness right now but is he i just I, th- I have a hard time seeing him right now i think as we speak today it's december 22nd i, I think yeah. uh he is slated at least in some mock drafts which don't mean anything to go number two overall yeah. like i said dude that's what you call the smoke screen right now so if they've been talking to anybody you know do you, the uh you know, a lot of these draft people have their their scouts or their their insiders. I do believe that if they're there's leaking them information, they're leaking them the wrong information about him right now. And if somebody takes it, I do. I mean, if they I predict it, and I don't want it to happen. I hope I'm wrong on this. But if I if they draft him top ten, he will be a bust. He will not work out. He's not going to be like Jay Cutler to where he's like the biggest tease in the NFL. But he'll be one of those teaser kind of players to where he's got the ability. And he's got the, you know, everything that you want, but he's just not teachable because he thinks he's already there and he just doesn't, you know, develop into the quarterback you want. But so if you draft if you draft him late, I think it'll be different because he'll uh, he'll he'll have a little bit more of a chip on his shoulder wanting to prove something. But then if but let's say they dra- he gets drafted late, if we're using your theory, draft him uh-huh. a little bit later, say mid second round, he sits for a year or two, he plays, Ooh. he becomes a star. That chip usually leaves when you become a star, though. You get paid. What is the true. old the old boxer said? It's a lot harder to train when you wake up in silk sheets. <laughs> it's true, but I, you know, he's a guy. But it's almost like what's going on with Garoppolo in San Francisco. A lot of these teams 
are wanting to pay the quarterbacks as they go. And they're realizing like what Kirk Cousins situation, they're realizing like, well, I dump a lot of money in the laps of these guys for that, for risking that. Like, why not keep them hungry and just keep them year to year? And you can do that with a franchise tag to a certain degree. We know it escalates as you, you know, hit them with the franchise tag more than once and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, you're going to be paying them that amount of cash anyway. So you might as well just take it year to year. And if you can do that with a guy like him, which if you know his history and, and I mean, guys grow up too. He's still a young buck, but, uh, but if, if if that's something that you're concerned about, that's how you would structure the deal is you would make it to where he's got to earn everything. He, like a Kaepernick deal, Andy Dalton's got that kind of deal right now to where it's just every year you never know. They got to go out and earn it. It's not like a Aaron Rodgers, you know, mega deal to where they're going to give him, you know, 67, even a Russell Wilson's kind of deal, 67 million guaranteed injury skill cap. You know, I, I would not do that with the guy with that kind of history. But you never know. I mean, if he if he develops in mentally and matures a little bit, you know, you maybe, uh, you maybe take a little bit of a chance. It's going to you know, be kind of a situational thing. But right now, I, I would not want to ever send him the message that he has arrived, even though that's what everybody's saying, that he's the most polished guy. But he's not. If he was so polished, why does he have a 500 record as a starter? I think I think it's 500. Again, it's like, you got to, to me, it's like, you got to dominate the college level before you can think about being a dominant quarterback, at least initially in the pro level. I'm with you there. What do you think about UCLA, uh, UCLA bringing in Chip Kelly to, to right the ship? Love it. I'm a big Chip fan. I have been. If you if you listen to my radio show on Saturdays with Fox Sports Radio, I'm always, and that's from uh, 10 to 1 East. No, 10 to 1 Pacific. That'd be 1 to 4 Eastern. Anyway, sometimes I get my time right would you now, have, so Would I'm you have up. wanted to play for Chip in the NFL? Um, I would have sat down with him and said, hey, man, you ever think about just, you know, varying the speeds a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> that's tough, man. I to like – you go three and out, let's say you hold the team to three and out, and then your offense goes three and out. I mean, I actually had a coach like that in college. He, uh, him and Chip, his name's Gary Crote, and him and Chip had, you know, history where they cross pass. And basically, they had, their philosophy is the same. We don't really, like, they don't really care about the defense. They, and they don't care about time possession. They just want to go out and score a lot of points. You know, and they think that if we just go score a lot of points, that'll help our defense out tremendously, which it doesn't. You know, and I, and I do believe Chip's learned that because they asked Chip when he got hired to UCLA, if he's going to run the same offense in Oregon, he did. He said no. He's like, we're going to have different tweaks, which I do believe he's going to vary the speed. You know, to where he's going to he's going to have that option of going fast. He's also going to have the option of going medium, to where you just sort of you've seen Jared Goff do that with the Rams, where you'll rush up to the to the line and then get the defense to sort of set and declare what they're going to do, and then you decipher what they're going to do, and then you go from there. And then also, if you're trying to just eat it. You know, eat that clock up because you got a you know two touchdown lead or a two possession lead. He's going to have that in his pocket too, to where they'll huddle and they'll pound you down. Because that's another thing about Chip that I think has been underrated. Is he usually when his offense is rolling, they have a sweet physical back. Like he had Blunt, you know, who's now with the Eagles. He had uh, Royce Freeman initially before he, uh, and then another guy. Oh, Jonathan Stewart. You know, those are all power backs. So it's it's a nice little compliment. But he's always sort of had that in his his back pocket, the ability to churn you down and run it to win it at the end. But he never really did it. So I, I, I anticipate him doing that now. But uh, but back to your initial question, I'm, I'm excited about it. I, I UCLA, because the thing that's interesting too, if you look at Oregon's rosters, when Chip was there, even now, man, he would come down into the Los Angeles, Southern California area, and he would recruit all the dudes that UCLA and USC didn't want. And he would turn them into those scat back slot receivers and you know whoever. I mean, his roster would have – a huge amount of guys from the Southern California area. Now he's going to get the cream of the crop guys and those guys that are going to fit his his scheme and his approach perfectly. And he knows how to recruit in LA and the Southern California area as good as anybody as he showed in Oregon. So, but key with him though is the defense. Well, who's his D coordinator? You know how are they going to operate? And because uh, he had the most success with a gentleman by the name of Nick Aliotti, stud, love the guy, but he's off fishing in the mountains right now or skiing because we're in winter. He's retired, not coming back. So we'll see if you know the defense coordinator he brings in can complement his offense. If so, I I do believe UCLA can start to now uh, knock on the doors a little bit of USC, at least in the western part of the United States, of being a, a team that's in that conversation for national championship implications. Oh, what about your uh, your old your old school, your alma mater, BYU? That's one of the another yeah. pastime of mine is watching you argue with BYU fans about <laughs> something with coaches, strength strength staff, coaches, oh, yeah. and then the coach's sister as well. I think has made a few comments. Yeah, well, what happened was is that 
you know, the, when you see a team who had, I think, 35 contributors out with injuries, and I've had talks with this strength coach, you know, my first interaction was like, oh, hey, bro, what's your philosophy? And he looks at me and he's like, my philosophy is barbells, dumbbells, and platforms. I'm like, what? And that's like going to a teacher saying, hey, man, what's your, what's your teaching curriculum slash philosophy? It's pencils, papers, notebooks, and computers. It sounds there like somebody go. I know, Brady, from a while, from a while Ooh. back. Who? Just a couple old coaches I've been around way, way back in the day. Oh yeah, yeah. You've been around them. Yeah, they don't they don't have any approach. Like they just basically they're they're just, you know, shoot from the hip, winging it. And that's what this guy was doing. And I so when he when he told me he didn't basically have any philosophy, I'm like, oh boy, okay, I'm gonna I'm just gonna be patient and let's see how this pans out. And when they started having well, first started off with how guys were moving. I mean I mean, when you got a guy by the name of Tanner Mangum, their starting quarterback, who's like I mean Two years removed from being in his mission and has been in the weight room and he looks stiff, big, bulky, and he can't move, but yet he's like gained a bunch of muscle. You're like, what are we doing? And I mean, he's only like a microcosm of the other guys, other guys. And then the other guys can't move either. It's just, I mean, it looked terrible. So I'm like, guys can't move. Guys are getting hurt. And then also, you know how the strength and conditioning coach has more time with the players than any other coach. Yep. You know, I mean, he gets pretty much 90% of the time with the player. So, I mean, he's going to have the inf biggest influence on him. And I'm like, this is, this is bad. Cause also I know they're the, the assistant strength conditioning coach who's, you know, I mean, he trained me back in the early, you know, the turn of the century, you know, in the 90, the 2000s and he's still implementing the same philosophy. And it's like, dude, we've, prog we've progressed and evolved since then. I mean, there's a lot better stuff you can do than just, you know, bench squat and power clean, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. And they're still doing that stuff. And so to me, it's just like, why not put the best resources out there? Why not have, you know, give your guys, because I felt bad for the players because they're the ones that are going to miss out. You know, they're not getting the best training. And then it's, you know, turning into a, an ugly pro a product on the field to boot. And so to me, I was like, you got to make a change there. And it sounds like they are. It sounds like even though they're keeping the guy that they're trying to divide it up now, instead of just having one program for everybody, they're going to have positional programs that specifically, you know, emphasize on, skill position more than just, Hey, let's go lift a bunch of weights and get bigger, faster, stronger, you know, regardless of what you're going to be asked to do on the field, which is good. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was a big sore spot for me, the old, uh, strength coach. And I do, I still do believe that's the most important hire in the college ranks anyway, for the reason I said that that coach spends more time with the players than any other coach pros, not as much as you know, age, most guys are doing their own stuff. And the strength and conditioning coach is more just trying to, <laughs> it's almost, it's like, it's like carrying a big bunch of groceries in a bag and just trying to keep them in there i mean there he's, <laughs> he's not going to really do much you know what i mean because they're all doing their own thing anyway because they're not with the team very much throughout the year comparatively to when they're at home or in their own facilities true what, what do you think I, I hear people try to say strength coaches in the nfl are if a team has a bunch of injuries it's always goes right to the strength coach like it's his fault and i always yeah. i have a hard time with that and the packers have had a lot of guys get hurt over the last over however many years i mean for a while now and I just don't know how that e equates to the strength coach. I can see what you're saying. If guys the college just look, is different. Yeah, yeah. because they, they do spend all their time. And if guys do exactly. look completely different, bigger, and just stiff, big, strong dudes, it doesn't help them on the football field. No. In the NFL, they don't have the time with the players to turn exactly. to, to morph their bodies like they do in college. Exactly. So that to me, it's the two different worlds, like you were saying, because in co like college, it is a – because that's all those – well, some of the players do go off, you know, and they'll get their guys at BYU. There are guys that do that. They'll go to, you know, different training facilities because they know they're not getting the right kind of training at the facility themselves. But still, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to avoid completely having to work with that strength and conditioning coach for the majority of your time. Whereas in the pros, man, you're, I mean, you're very rarely with the strength and conditioning coach. And Mark Lavat's one of the best, man. And there's no question he's one of the best. If dudes will just listen to him. And if they would just do his system, you, you would probably see a lot of these guys re remain healthy instead of finding themselves on the IR. I mean, I'm telling you. And that, to me, the function like in the NFL is of guys getting hurt if, if they have a good strength coach like in Green Bay is more – it's not what they're doing with him. It's actually what, what the heck are they doing when he's not in the – when they're not in the facility, which is the majority of the time. With their weird so guru. With these – that's the problem, I think. A lot of NFL these, guys, yeah, gurus, yeah. they think they, they, they get some money and they have these hang, people that hang around them and these so-called experts that have the newest and the best thing. And that a lot of times, we saw it a lot. Guys would come to training camp very first day and tear a hamstring or, or get yeah. hurt because they've been doing these stupid 
plyo explosive drills with some guy that's probably Justin Bieber's pastor and thinks they, they're going to make him a better football player. <laughs> that's exactly right. The guy's out so there yeah, with, you. with you. The guy yeah, out there man. with you, I think. He's a good, he seems like a good guy. Yeah, he's done. He's down the road right now, and, uh, but no, really, the yeah, I mean that's that's how it is, and that's why you can't treat the like the strength conditioning coach in the NFL is very different than the influence of the strength and conditioning coach at the college ranks. And so, in the college ranks, you can squarely blame it on the strength conditioning coach injuries. The pros, you can't. It's got to be on each individual player, and uh, if that player's getting injured, then he's got to go back and look at what he's doing because he's because you know in the NFL, you're your own brand. You know, college, you're not. You're the brand of the college. And so they're going to want you to do what, they, you know, they have set up for you in college. Whereas in the pros, you got enough free time to where you're, you're working individually with your kind of gurus. And if they're not giving you the right kind of information and giving you the right kind of, uh, you know, protocols to train with, then, yeah, you're going to have some issues. But especially if you got a good guy like Mark. Mark, and that's one thing I, I, I think in Green Bay, it's more of the guys don't rely on him enough. I mean, he is a heck of a resource. And uh, and that's to their own fault. So it's not on him. You know, that's on the players. What do you think? I'm sure you, you've talked about it a lot on your radio shows with the whole – with the, the A-Rod situation, him coming back and then shutting him down. Shut him down. I, I think it was smart. Once you have no shot at the playoffs, I don't know why you would have him play in the last two games. Well, to me it was always about you bring him back, try to go for the playoffs, but if you don't have a chance, we got to showcase Hundley. That's to me what – my gut was with them all the time is they want Hunley out of there and not like they need to get rid of him. It's just, they want to get something for him. And you know, Ted, he's gotten to this mood lately to where he's like really superstitious about Aaron to where he, if he feels like he fortifies too much of the depth behind him, that Aaron's going to get injured for that's like literally what he thinks. So, he thinks so I think in his mind, you know, I think in his mind, he would rather just like, you know, trade off Hunley, get the most for him. And so the best way to do that is, is, have him go out because he was starting to, you know, catch his stride a little bit there before Aaron came back. But didn't he lead two overtime victories and almost knocked off the Steelers? And so to me, it's just like they, they saw him sort of emerging and they're like, man, we got to keep this going because right now it's I don't think they'd get much for him. Whereas if he goes and has two strong games, and they win these last two games and, and he shows, again, huge steps forward then they feel like they got something they can sell. So to me, this is a business decision about let's see what we can get out of Hunley. Let's see if we can't keep him on that same track that we felt like he was on when Aaron was out. And then in the offseason, let's trade him off. I don't, I don't believe it's about Aaron. It's about, you know, I mean, and they get to use the, the whole injury thing as a front. Like, oh, yeah, he's injured. We want to rest him. But no, the reality is in the back of their heads, we're like, yeah, we want to, we want to get as much as we can for Hunley. So let's shut Aaron down. You know, we'll, we'll give him his new historically big contract in the offseason. And then hopefully at the same time, we can parlay bread into some other assets, you know, some either draft pick players, whatever it is, and then uh, move on from there. So, I mean, and then I think that's a lot with every position. They want to see guys, you know, perform and they and generally when you're out of the playoffs, they want to see the young guys. They want to see what they got. And, and also I, what I'm hoping happens, because when the whole situation went with Brett Hundley taking over for Aaron, is that Mike was so afraid to implement the true read option offense. You know what I mean with Brett? Because I think he was afraid that if Brett went out and got hurt, they'd have to turn to Callahan, which they felt like their chances were zero with Callahan. They didn't even want the guy in the preseason, right? And so now that they have nothing to lose, they're trying to showcase Hundley. They're, I, I believe they're finally – I hope they do. I'm trying to send like these telepathic waves to Mike. Come on, do it. Run the read option, man. Have that be the, me the mechanism in every one of your plays. He's going to do so good. I mean, and it's not like the scheme is, you know, isn't accepted anymore in the NFL. We see it ran in the Seattle. We see it ran when Deshaun Watson was healthy. We, we've seen it run for years with the Carolina Panthers. We've seen it, you know, with uh, the Philadelphia Eagles and even currently with Carson Wentz. Obviously, Chip Kelly, he did good things with it. So I, I believe it's slowly but surely being more and more accepted. RG3, you know, back in 2000 and. Uh, uh, 12 with the Washington Redskins. They were using that, and that he had a tremendous amount of success where he became the offensive rookie of the year. So, I mean, I don't know why Mark doesn't go full blow into that because at the very least, or the very worst case scenario, is Hundley gets knocked out. Okay, you throw Callahan in there and you see what you got with him. So you think if Hundley goes out there and has finishes the season strong that a team will trade for him to be their starting quarterback? I don't know if they would say let's we're going to anoint you as the starter, but I wouldn't doubt if teams got involved and said, okay, we're going to we're going to we want a vet. He would be a guy they would target because there's not going to be any good vets. There's never really any good vets available on the market. Last year there was with Romo, uh, and unfortunately nobody wanted to pay him his twenty mil, which 
if I was the Broncos, I would have paid him 20 mil, no question, because they would be a completely different team this year if they would have. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, the Broncos, for example, I'd be a team that I would imagine they want to bring a vet in that has some experience that could be the starter, and then they'll go draft a high guy. A lot like what the, uh, the Chicago Bears did this last year with Mike Lennon. You know, they bring him in, and they're like, okay, let's see how the draft pans out, and then they trade for Trubisky. So I would imagine a team in that scenario, the, the Broncos, the Jets, you know, uh, off the top of my head, who else would be out there looking for a quarterback? Uh, you know, somebody like that to where, you know, they're bringing a veteran, but they're obviously going to bring in a high draft pick, first, second rounder at a quarterback position, have him compete. So I think he looks he looks good for that spot, you know, but I, would, I wouldn't say like, you know, any Garoppolo kind of situations are going to pop up. He hasn't earned that kind of value yet. No. Well, I don't know. Can you say the Chicago situation worked out well where you pay – Pay uh no lending all that oh. money and then you trade up it doesn't and now you're stuck with like do we have we have two do we have any is two quarterbacks zero quarterbacks <laughs> exactly well they've mishandled the situation I mean there's I mean if I was Glennon dude I would have been hot well Glennon was ever. at did you know they he was at a draft party that the Chicago Bears put on that they sent him to <laughs> in front of a bunch of fans when they traded and picked Mit Mitchell Trubisky and he there was like an article and he's saying. Yeah, this is really weird. Like, I, I'm wondering why am I here when this happened. So, I'm sure you're shocked to know that there wasn't communication between the PR and the co like the coach. The, they didn't let him know. It's amazing that at such high levels that no one will communicate. Well, I don't think they wanted to, you know, yeah. because they, they didn't want. Everyone's paranoid. Exactly. They didn't want any information getting leaked out there that they wanted him. But I mean, it's like it wouldn't have made a difference because the 49ers were waiting for them to give him the pretty much as much as they possibly could get what they ended up getting. But to me, that I'm not worried about that. To me, it's more how they handled it when they benched Mike Lennon. He, I mean, he wasn't the reason why they lost. If you remember, who were they playing? They were playing uh, early on in the season. might have been week two, week three. And they, they were down, I think, a score. And all they needed to do was score a touchdown and they win the game. And they're like on their uh, – they're, so they're down on the opposing team's like 10, 15-yard line. And there was two passes in the end zone that were dropped, like flat out dropped. Atlanta. Lose the game. Atlanta game. Lose, exactly. That's exactly right. And uh, and lo and behold, they put it all on Mike Lennon like it was his fault. I'm like, that wasn't his fault. I was like, that's awesome. You should be pumped about that. I mean, you're playing against the defending NFC champs in your house, and you should have probably beat them. I mean, you had two guys drop passes. And then the next week, somewhat of the same. And then all of a sudden, when Trubisky gets tossed in there, they change their whole offense. They make it simpler. They run the ball more. I'm like, well, oh, man, if I was Glenn, I'd be, I'd be so ticked. It's like, dude, why don't you do that with me in there? We probably would have won some more games, and you would still have to, you know, have some time to wait for Trubisky because he just wasn't ready. I mean, he didn't legitimately make an NFL throw, like a legit NFL throw, until like last week. What do you I mean, mean by What do you calls. mean by that? What I mean by that is he was running the RPO kind of stuff that was all simple kind of, you know, option out, in and out routes. He wasn't threaded the needle. He wasn't like throwing it from one side of the field to the other on these comeback back shoulder fades, you know, those, those high timing throws. He didn't throw it into like this tight window. Every pass was to a guy who was like wide open beyond measure. It's like, yeah, okay, that, yeah, that's great. But let's see you zip one in and let's see you grind one in there, you know? And I mean, he, he didn't show that. Let's see you do, you know, let's see you do a timing route with any of your receivers. Didn't do that. You know, it was all, like I said, big time uh, college throws, but nothing to where you're like, yep, this guy's the future at the position. But he, I mean, he showed some promise, which he will. I mean, he, he's young and he's developing, but yeah, like I said, he never once really threw a legit NFL throw where you're like, okay, this guy's got something. Like, for example, just Deshaun Kaiser in the uh, preseason had one legit NFL throw that I was like, yeah, you got to make him the starter based off that one throw. And it basically, he was facing pressure in the middle of, his, of the pocket. And uh, and as he's getting hit, he just zings one down on a go route, you know, like a 50 50 ball to his receiver. But it, he, so he gets blasted, the ball lands right into the lap of the receiver touchdown. I was like, that's an NFL throw. You know, the receiver's not wide open, he's in the middle of pressure. And then he's got to throw an accurate bomb. I mean, that's like high-level stuff. Whereas, you know, Trubisky, he would have probably eaten it, taken the sack, which is fine. I mean, it's not a, you know, a bad thing to to live for another day. But point is, is that you're exactly right. I don't even think that Chicago has like any idea who their next quarterback is outside. They got. I think it's Trubisky because they gave up so much for him. Yeah. How about uh? What about Eli though? I could see Eli going to. Oh, that's a good point. Going to Denver possibly. And and what do you think oh, yeah. of how? How our old uh, tight ends coach in Green Bay, Ben McAdoo, handled that whole debacle, man. <laughs> well, I I don't have a problem with it. I, I it's but, uh, to okay. me it wasn't on Ben McAdoo. Can I can I? I'm sorry, I want to jump in. I should have told you my Do opinion it. first. So, Do it. My whole thing was if you're going to bet. Well, first off, 
you might want to talk to the execs, the GM, the owner before you do it. You got fired a week yeah. later, and Eli came back in the lineup, whatever. But if you're going to bench Eli, I understand if you would have drafted Pat Mahomes and you wanted to see what your future franchise quarterback may be, get some reps, that'll do it. But you put Geno Smith, is that correct? Yeah. You put Geno Smith, you benched him for Geno Smith, and I, it's a safe bet to say that they, the Giants never thought Geno was the future. Yeah. So why do you bench him for somebody that's not yeah, that's the point. future? It's a good point. Very good point. I was under the impression that they w- did talk it over with everybody and that they're basically saying to McAdoo, like, we're going to move on from Eli, so go ahead and you know do whatever you got to do to figure out you know what, what these young guys are all about. And he took it to the level from – this is what I understand, that he took it to the level like, oh, okay, so you want us – well, the only way we're going to see what these guys are about is we've got to play them. You know, and they just said, whatever you got to do. So it sounds like to me that they said to do that very thing of let's see who we got, but they were shocked at the backlash. And instead of them taking responsibility, like, yeah, we told Ben to do this, they put it all on Ben. That's what I understand because you're right. It made zero sense. But then at the same time, the thing that bothered me about it is how much of a crybaby Eli was. And then his boy, Philip Rivers, Mr. Mental Midget himself in San Diego started being a crybaby. Like, oh, that's just disrespectful. It's like, yeah, you were the guy that said that when, you know, that he was asked, why, you know, what, how, would, how, how would you have reacted if the San Diego Chargers would have drafted Deshaun Watson last year? And he said, oh, not very good. I don't want competition. I, I, I'm anointed to the quarterback. I'm entitled to this position until I say, I, it's like, you, who are these guys? Nothing's given to you. You know, you're not entitled to anything. You got to go out and earn it every day. And when you play in a business like the NFL, everybody's has an expiration date. You and I saw it with a legend of Brett Favre. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. if it can happen to him, he's by far a better quarterback than Eli Manning and Phillip Rivers put together. Uh, it can happen to them too. And they act like they're like immune to it. Like if it happens to him, it's like, oh my gosh, they start crying and making a big deal about it. And you know, Eli, he's got more control than I think any owner in the NFL. Right? I mean, he's manipulated his draft stats, status. You know, back when he was first drafted by the Chargers, he got out of that when I mean, he was drafted by the Giants. Now he's manipulated basically the whole fan base to inject him back as the starter, which to me it was like a perfect opportunity to just say goodbye to the Giants. They're going nowhere fast. They're multiple ways, players away from being Super Bowl contenders. I would have just said, hey, Peyton, start talking to John for me, John Elway. And let's get a deal done, you know, and I, I'd love it because if he went to to the Broncos, their defense is still good. People don't realize it. Their defense right now, their struggles are embedded with their offense and their lack of trust in the offense that they're actually going to go out and help you win games. If you get a legit quarterback behind center that can go out and win you some games, inject more of that, off, uh, that confidence in that defense, they're going to play like they did. They're still got their core guys there. And so to me, you just you just just ride this out, man. Just take it like a man, you know, just take your medicine. You know, just sort of let the, let everything sort of implode, which it would have happened with Geno Smith. And then at the end of the season, he has a no trade clause. I mean, you could, I mean, man, he could have just driven that whole entire negotiation. Just say, man, you know what? Give me my private jet. I mean, he could have just listed off his demands and say, just send me out of here. Though. I'll, I'll waive my tra- no trade clause. And he would have been able to do it. But, you know, his instinct of Mr. Mr. Entitlement jumped in and it, you know, maybe ruined it for him and himself. I, not, 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 you know, I, I still believe Eli is a, a for sure. Uh, you know, without a doubt, hall a first ballot Hall of Famer at the very least, just eventually a Hall of Famer. But uh, but no, I that that was my big takeaway. My what big did, takeaway is it was more on the 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 front office and the the executives and the owners that were trying to so sort of give those clues to Ben and, and Ben went with it. And then when it turned out to be a disaster, instead of owning it, they put it all on Ben and fired him. That's very possible that they didn't realize the backlash that they would get. Yeah. And so they, if you're the owner, you can push it off on on somebody yeah. else. But the, when you say Eli manipulated it, what do you what do you say, crybaby? Like literally, like he he cried. But he stood he cried into the interview. It didn't look like that's. I think what got everybody on his side. He showed some yeah. like he showed Humanity. that he was he was real, and people felt sympathy and empathy for the guy. What happened? What'd you take that as? No, I felt I thought he was being a little whiner. It's like, dude, stop crying. He I seemed mean, he who, seemed just sad. He didn't seem like he was oh, whining. Oh my gosh, he was the biggest whiner, crybaby. <laughs> it reminded me of my little kids. I was like, are you serious? I mean, I'd have just said, stop it. Talk to me like a person. Use words. Don't cry and sniffle and whine at me. Just talk to me. And so, I mean, but it just, I mean, that's how these guys are. I mean, because and, and, to me, it's like, yeah, I'd cry over like travesties, like death and suffering and stuff like that. But not over a guy that's a multimillionaire that's going to land on his feet with another team to compete for a Super Bowl next year at the very least. Are you going to you're going to cry over that? 
I mean, come on, have some perspective. And then your boy jumps in on Philip, and he's out there throwing up his arms and, oh, defending him because, you know, why he's defending him because he's feeling that same thing may happen to him. Yep. As Anthony Lynn, it seems like is uh, he's a little bit over Philip right now. And the way Philip's played in these critical games, you could also say that maybe, just maybe, uh, you know, Philip may be encountering that kind of same situation sooner than later, and he's not wanting to have, have anything to, to have with it because they think in their minds that they they've earned the right, based off of their their talents and their production, to walk away on their terms. And again, it's like, well, you guys are huge Brett Favre fans. I mean, you didn't see what happened there. Come on now, let's have a little bit of reality here. So that's why I don't feel sorry for him for a second. And I did. I looked at him as a crybaby. Well, yeah, I think people see that and they realize, like, oh, he really does care. And of course he cares. But at the same well, time, yeah, I don't feel you can't feel like you said. You got to have perspective. It's hard to feel. You you shouldn't feel bad for any professional athlete, really. No, unless you're. Uh, Zach Miller, who yeah. almost got his leg amputated. I mean, that's like real life crazy stuff. I can feel sorry for a guy then. That's like that's really heavy, you know. But a guy that all of a sudden you get benched because of an organizational decision, and I'm not, I'm not going to feel sorry for you for one second. And and then, and like I said, it's not like Eli's talents have gone anywhere. You put him on another team, he can e- easily make a team like the Broncos a Super Bowl contender. And heck, if you want to stay in New York, not to say they'd become Super Bowl contenders, but they'd be a lot better if. Uh, the uh, the Jets had Eli Manning also. So, I mean, there, there's opportunities there. It's not like all of a sudden all is lost. I mean, that seemed like it was like a funeral. It, you know, it was like somebody had died in his family. I was like, dude, geez, pull it back, man. It's okay. It's okay. You're going to be fine. It's the business. Welcome to it. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, he's been around it for so long. You think you'd already know what's going to, you know, eventually it's going to happen to you. You know, they're going to tell you, we don't want you back anymore. And I guess you can cry about it, but uh, that's not, I don't think going to make anything better. When's the last time you cried? Oh, I cry every day. No, you don't. You just said travesties. You said travesties and maybe a death you may well, I shed cry a tear. I cry when I'm happy. Do you? I I, oh, oh, yeah. I tell oh, my yeah, kids I that. Some... I tell my kids, we get, hey, we don't need to cry when we're sad or we're whining because my son is almost five and he, he, he there's definitely points every day where he's crying. And <laughs> I tell him, hey, man, we only we cry when we're happy. I'm not, I said, yes. dad cries. You've seen dad cry when I'm happy. I don't cry when I'm sad. I'll cry when I'm sad, but I'll cry. But like I, what? I cry all the time. You mean I like if someone's to cry. You mean a death, like a sadness, because like a death. I mean, well, it's I don't know if death will do it to me, but it's some sometimes like the situation of the death. Like if it's a young little child that hasn't lived their life and had opportunities, yeah, and things yeah, like it's yeah. sad that they didn't have that you know opportunity, and so that will get me. I mean, um, like I wouldn't cry being sad if like. Oh, I'm just having a blue day. I don't know. It's oh, raining. No, no. It's raining. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> okay. you know that's an attitude. Thing. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not moping around, but no, there's certain things that'll prick my heart, you know. But more than anything, it's just, you know, I mean, like, I, there, there was, a, you know, a, a church one day we had uh, a lady get up and sh- she was watching her grandchild and and she fell asleep on the couch and the grandchild ended up somehow ending up in the backyard with a pool without a fence and oh. dove in and drowned, you know. And and she was awesome because she got up and she just basically said, I am, I'm at fault. I mean, and she, it's, it's like, it's. it's it's just tough to say it's all on you, but the fact that she got up, you know, in a public place, and this happened over a year ago, by the way, mm-hmm. but she got up and talked about it, talked about it, and the way she did that, that got me. You know, I thought that was, that was, that takes a tremendous amount of strength, you know, and then, you know, it just, and also showed her perspective that, you know, death isn't the end, you know, and uh, showed her hope and her faith and those kinds of things. And all that added up together will uh, prick your heart every single time. So, I cry quite often, Age. I'm not this hardened guy. I'm, I'm never cry. I'm so tough. I'm not that kind of guy. But th- there are certain times, as you know, that it's appropriate to cry. It's fine to cry, but not when you get benched because the organization's trying to go in another direction. Sorry. Great point. I, I, I agree with you 100%. I'm not scared to cry at all. You know that as yeah. well. But oh, yeah, yeah. not because of something happened where I don't – It's just. I guess it's hard when, when someone makes – so much money it's really tough to have empathy for them when it's a situation like that like if something happened to Eli's family or anything of course we'd be, be we'd, tough yeah you'd feel awful but when yeah. it's when someone's sad because their football life one game like a start got taken away from when you when you take a step back and you look at the perspective oh man okay there's a lot happening in the world should I really uh, yeah. lose my mind over this exactly well it happened I remember one time old our guy Aaron Cantman comes into the weight room and is after Tausch had torn his ACL the second time in 2009, no, 2008, maybe 2000, I don't know. 
He's like, I feel so bad for Tausch. I was like, are you flipping kidding me? I was like, this guy's going to recover fully from his ACL, which he did. And I was like, he's still going to make millions of dollars, which he did. And I was like, and you're feeling sorry for this guy? And I was like, why, why don't you take that sorriness that you're feeling and you know, point it in some other direction? And, and as he sort of sat there, he's like, that's, that's a good point. I was like, what are we doing? I mean, yeah, like let's put it all in perspective here. It's because when we get into that football world, sometimes that's all we think that exists is that football world, which it, it, there's other stuff going on. You know what? There's a matter of fact, there's people out there, and I've learned this, that don't even care about NFL football. No. They don't even care about sports. No way. <laughs> That'll blow your mind, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> But it's true. Well, every don't you think that ninety eight percent, maybe ninety nine percent of guys in NFL locker rooms that are on a team, they just assume everybody on the planet watches every single game. <laughs> yes, and they they assume everybody knows their name. They assume. I mean, I mean, you would have believed. I mean, when somebody, and I even do believe, like people that don't follow the game think that we think that way. Because there'll be times where I'll talk with somebody and they'll, and they'll, they'll introduce me. Yeah, this guy played in the NFL a little bit. And they'll be like, you know, I've never watched an NFL game. You, you know, I don't want to offend you. You know, they yeah. like to always preface it by saying that. I'm like, no, I'm fine with that. But it's funny. Like, they even think that, that, you know, people would come to the point of being offended. Oh, you don't know my name? You've never watched me? So I would say, absolutely. You know, a, a lot of us fall into that trap of saying, yeah, I mean, I'm on national TV. Millions of people watch me. Every, that means everybody. Everybody yeah. should know who I am. I mean, come on. No, not not the reality that we live in. Don't you think that is plays a, a huge factor in why a lot of a lot of professional athletes struggle once they get done playing? They can't oh, really no question. mesh back into society and find something that they're passionate about. No question, man, because they define themselves as football players, and then when that dies, based off of either their own choice or organizational choices, like Eli Manning had experienced, they die and they 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 lose their purpose. And I mean. And they lose, you know, uh, kind of that self-identity that drove them. And then the crowd, I mean, I think a lot of it's that ego, you know, the crowd's cheering for you and people are, oh, hey, after, you know, the game or even just in public, they're asking for your autograph. All of a sudden that doesn't happen anymore, or at least as frequently. And uh, it starts to affect your self-worth because that's how you equated your self-worth is by how many autographs people asked for, from you or how many people were cheering you on or how much money you made or whatever. And and so, yeah, I do believe that has a lot to do with depression, which I, I do believe a lot of these guys blame it on the CTE, when in fact it's tied more into like an identity crisis, you know, back to our CTE conversation. So, yeah, I mean, that's a, a big, and, and the NFL, I think, is doing a nice job of trying to help guys get out of that kind of funk of saying, oh, this is not who you are. And, and I do believe that will continue to evolve moving forward. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's crazy to see it i mean the, the guys that they're basically their life ends when their football career ends because that's all that really mattered to them and that's all they see them are they all they saw themselves as well one of the the best so i had ryan leaf on here uh a week ago and uh -huh. one of the craziest ones ever because one of the greatest players of all time junior Seau, committed suicide yeah. ryan played with him there's a, the famous clip i talked with ryan about junior walking over and breaking up a little scuffle ryan was that's having right, with right. the beat writer and junior's shirtless and he's just jacked but he played for so many years and for whatever reason he struggled hard with it ended up taking his own life that's crazy to think about a guy when you look at him you watch him on tv and you see him in interviews afterwards junior you think like wow this guy has everything figured yeah. out but he has so all confident this, yeah, yeah he has all this whatever was going on in his head i guess i don't know if there's anyone he could confide in or not afterwards but why i, I wonder why I don't. I just don't know. It's that's scary when you see that kind of stuff. No question, and it's fascinating to me because this is one thing when, when, when I when we were in the NFL locker room together is, and we talked about it a lot is how insecure guys mm -hmm. are. Like it's unbelievable that you have these dudes that when you look at it in comparison to life, I mean, what what's the odds? One in ten million or whatever that you even make it on an NFL team. So these are like we were in a locker room full of dudes that are like the best of the best have accomplished something that very few have ever accomplished, have tremendous talents, and yet they're some of the most insecure people <laughs> that you'll ever be around. I'm like, what? what is going on here? This is absolutely crazy. And so it's it's one of those things to the, the humanity still seeps in there, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I do believe that was with Junior. But uh, to me, I, I do believe that was that case to where he was so immersed into a football guy that when that ended, he just, I, I don't know if he had a direction to go. And uh, his life lost meaning. And when you're in that kind of space, it gets scary. It's dark. It's dreary. And, uh, you know, that's where some, you know, drastic things happen. But, uh, 
yeah, I mean, that's, that's an absolute reality that people deal with in our, in, in our sport and all sport. I, I think in everything, you know, you, you hear business guys doing the same thing. I mean, you hear when that crash happened of the economy, dudes were committing suicide, jumping off bridges, you know, in the finance world because they lost everything, you know, and they lost their identity basically. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's important to have your identity based on things that don't come and go, but on things that are solid foundations and things that, uh, they can say they, they last into the eternities. So other than the LDS church, where could people turn? Where do you, where would you turn to? You got to turn to the spiritual world. Yeah. Your spirituality, the LDS church. Or if you, or if you want to go to the LDS church, I was just saying. Come I, on. Come I knew on that in, would guys. be your answer. I knew that. No, you won't let me in, Brady. I already asked you. <laughs> what are you, you talking? Come you on. You won't let me in. I'm dirty. I can't I get know. into the temple. I have no issues with you coming in. You go to a temple anytime. There's, Where? There's, they open it. They do an open house temple. Uh, they either do it for, they do. Open they house. Do it for, Where I can stand in the back row behind the little rope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why would you want to go into the carpet? Anyway? I want to go in with you, Brady. I was in Salt Lake for two straight weekends this year doing games and I tried to get in. I said, I know I held up a picture Whoa. of you. I said, I know Brady, yeah. this is my guy. And I know you hate the whole state of Utah. So they're like, no chance he's coming in. <laughs> what are you talking about? You, I don't, the Utah fans, and that's different than the state of Utah. Okay. Utah fan base. No, but I mean, even the even even members of the church aren't permitted into the temples because you're you have this temple recommend, and on the temple recommend, or at least the uh, the to get a temple recommend, which is like a pass. You know, you go and they scan it. You go in. It's like a like a ticket. They ask you certain questions. You know, and uh, if. Like for for example, do you uh, do you pay your tithes? You know things like that. Do you believe Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, or was a prophet of God, or was a restoration? You know, a, a key figure in the restoration. You know, or do you conspire with any other faiths and groups that go against the church? Those kinds of things. That if uh, you say, yeah, I do, yeah, there's no reason for you to go into the temple. It'd be a waste of your time. You know what I'm saying? And also, it'd be a waste of your time if you went in there and you didn't believe. You know, and and the things that. Uh, the church is based off of it would it would be a completely uh, worthless experience you'd be like what is going on in here okay this isn't as cool as i thought it was so open house is good for you now if you get to that point you know and you want to come in i'm more than happy to help you but it's uh it's very symbolic i'll put it that way it's very symbolic and so unless like like i said you're tapped into it it'll be like all over your head you'll be like okay i'm wasting my time here so don't worry about that age but no where people can find it i, I do believe is in spirituality because regardless of what your definition of it is it is something that it transcends what we know as the temporal, what we know that can be rusted, that can be destroyed, that can, you know, that, that comes and goes. You know, the spiritual is the thing that lasts through the eternity. So you have some kind of spiritual grounding because that's really where you're going to find your true identity, you know, because our identity do, they, it is above and beyond any label, any title, any kind of thing you do. And it, it transcends all of that to the point to where if you can, you know, base your identity off of that, you know, things will come and go, you know, your professions will come and go, successes, failures will happen. And you'll know that, hey, that's just part of the bigger picture. And it will, instead of being something that tears you down, be something that only drives you to further, uh, uh, you know, go after your dreams and aspirations. So look through the spiritual, you know, and there's a lot of different sources of that. And yeah, one is the LDS church. They call it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're just, we're not just the Mormons, because remember, Mormon's a prophet now, okay? We're not all prophets, you know, like Mormon. And they say, hey, like people ask me all the time, are you Mormon? I'm like, well, you, you mean, am I Mormon? Like the prophet Mormon or am I Brady Papinga? What do you want from me here? You know? And so, yeah, remember that. Uh, we're not Mormons in terms of all the Mormon, because Mormon was the guy that uh, he put the Book of Mormon together. Uh, but no, we're all individual people and part of the church by the name of the Church of Jesus Christ, Larry Saints. I highly recommend it. If you want to go, all the buildings are open for all visitors, even you, AJ. You can go there and uh, you can come see what we're all about. But yeah, spirituality is the key there in my, you know, in my belief. Uh, that's good. You ever see uh, Jonathan Butnick out there? He lives in WeHo. Yeah. Yeah, man. I've seen a WeHo. Yeah, the West Hollywood area. Yeah, I've seen Jonathan a couple times. We sat down and had a nice little lunch. Him and Bill Ryder. You ever ran into Bill Ryder? I just did One his radio show. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's a good dude. One of the good dudes in the business. And uh, but yeah, old Butnick. He's he's a classic. I mean, the name itself is PR guy. Unforgettable for people that don't know. I've mentioned him a few times. He's a yeah PR guy in Green Bay. Now he lives in L.A. and has another nice gig with a startup. But I know you're you're an L.A. guy, so I figured you guys yeah. cross paths. Yeah, man. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of you. You got to come down, age. You got to give us a visit. I'll take you boogie boarding, you know. Mm. And uh, yeah, man. There's, Once you uh, surf, there's a lot of good options. Well, the reason is because I've spent so much time in a training room. Because this is the thing I didn't realize until I started going out and hitting the waves, that most of the really good fun waves, like they could be, you know, let's say six, seven feet tall, 
it's only in like three or four feet deep of water. Yeah. So if you fall the wrong way, you would believe how many dudes break their collarbones, break their necks. So I'm like, you know what? I don't want to deal with that, man. Cause I, I surfed and I kept falling like head first. And fortunately I would like, you know, roll up into a ball or, you know, sort of, you know, just, you know, take away a little bit of the edge of the fall and not break my neck or anything. But I was like, this is too flipping dangerous. So I'm just going to lay on the board, you know, and then I, then everything's taken out. And then, and another key too, when you, when I realized this, you have to be the ultimate in, in terms of relinquishing when you boogie border in the waves. Because when the wave grabs you and slams you to the ground, you got to just go limp or else you're going to hurt your knee, you're going to hurt your ankle. So to me, it's all about like getting that rush, but then at all costs, avoiding having to go back to the training room, which I've spent already about two years of my life doing when you look at those two ACLs. So that's, that's the reason. But then I sort of contradict myself when I ski. I don't know if you ski. Uh, I, I, I ski like crazy and more people tear their ACLs skiing than even playing sports. But, but anyway, that's, but, so I'm trying to mitigate some of my uh, risk in terms of getting injured. That's why I lay on the board instead of standing up on it. Gotcha. I, I know about yeah. submitting. I know about going limp from practicing with you on a daily basis for <laughs> years and years. <laughs> you because the you're an absolute that. missile of friendly fire of just diving at my knees. And just you have no clue that you're just trying to end so people's true. careers. Not trying. Not trying to okay, do yeah, this, inadvertently. No, yeah. No, you were like the Matrix, man. There was one time. <laughs> I don't remember who it was, but you got caught and you and it was like, if it wasn't, if you didn't have this an unbelievable ability to somehow jump out of getting your knee twisted, you'd have blown your knee. I do. I, I was crazy. Cause I remember, I don't know who it was. They hit your, like they hit your knee to where it went straight. And then another dude was coming to almost roll up on you and you literally jumped in the air, like boom, jumped in the air and somehow got out of the compromising position. And I was like, that was unbelievable. How did he do that? So I don't know what you were doing there, Age, but that was that was a talent in of, of itself, which is why. How many games in a row did you play again? One hundred and I don't twenty or something. Like I that? missed one with a with a calf. Oh, but outside of that, you played of a uh, hundred and some odd something, games. Of, yeah, you missed one. I mean, that's phenomenal. So I mean, that goes to show you, like, if you got that ability, that helps with your longevity, man. So yeah, so you were like the Matrix. I was impressed very much. So it was like slow motion. <laughs> where you just sort of float in the air. and But could you believe Carson Wentz, though, dude, how he tore his ACL? Have you ever seen anybody in the air how get his it? leg twisted? I mean, that's unbelievable. He, he, like, he, like, he, he probably did something that's equivalent in terms of probabilities to winning like the billion-dollar lottery. Was it's it unbelievable. Do you think it was hanging on by a thread? Is that why? No, I just he just got hit perfect. It was perfect timing by I, I believe it was the safety of the the Rams and then some other dude to where it just it just twisted his knee to where it blew his ACL. Like I've never seen that. Usually you got your leg planted wrong, like your situation you jumped out of, and your knee goes straight or something happens to where now it's just if it twists or it gets landed on, you're gonna just pop it. His was he was diving through the air and it just you know two guys simultaneously hitting his leg to where it just blew it. I mean that's crazy. Bad luck. Never seen that before. Some bad luck, man. For Terrible him. luck. Yeah. All right, Brady. Thank you so much for your time, man. Anytime, Age. It's good. Anytime to, you need me, you where, know. Where can people find you that want to want to check out all of your your beautiful content you're putting out weekly, daily? Hourly? Yeah, yeah. Go to at Brady Papinga. It's just my name. All you know, lower. You know, I, I don't even lowercase, uppercase means anything, but it's all one word: B R A D Y P O P P I N G A with the at sign in front of it. And if you want to engage in any conversations, I will give you my honest opinion. And uh, I will debate with you if you want to debate too. I'm just saying, I just, I'm not, and I don't do it out of any kind of bad intentions. It's just, you know what? It's just more of let's let's like talk this out. And uh, very and very rarely does it ever turn into be something negative because if it goes down that road, I just block you. But if not, it'll be a good kind of a, you know uplifting experience for us both. So check me out there. Awesome. All right, yeah. Brady. Thanks so much. Talk to you a little bit, man. All right, buddy. Have a wonderful day, big guy. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at officialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawkcast.